The queen was originally conceived as a frumpy, ugly woman. It was more in line with the Fleischer version of Snow White from 1933, where the queen essentially looked like an evil version of Olive Long. For this Even the dwarves, who live isolated in the woods, know of her reputation and her dealings in the black arts. Foul Fellow and Gideon were essentially written to be a vaudeville duo. Out of all the villains in the movie, they come across as the most likable, because the scenes with them are incredibly funny. I'll just refer to him by his translated name, the Fire Eater. He is the puppet master at the local marionette theater, where Pinocchio goes on his own accord instead of going to school. The other trivia is that in an interview with artist Yoshi Katobi, I do not know if I pronounced that right, who worked for Nintendo, it was revealed that part of the design of Wario was inspired by Stromboli. Who knew? One example is the 1991 short film Michael and Mickey, which was shown at the MGM Studios behind the scenes tour. In a screening room, Chernabog towers over Mickey Mouse in all his demonic glory, but when then CEO Michael Eisner tells him to sit down, Chernabog's entire demeanor changes, and he sheepishly apologizes. When I cover one movie in this retrospective series, I plan on doing the whole franchise. For example, when I get to Aladdin, I will not only cover Jafar and Iago in that entry, but I'll also talk about characters like Abi Small and Mosenrath. Since Anderson never describes the Jack in the Box in any detail, the animators went through many design ideas on how to portray the villain. There are comical takes on the character, like a king or a pirate, and then there's a really creepy clown version of him as well. It Jack, despite being poor and wanting to help his mother, is still not the most likable character, since he basically breaks into someone else's house, takes their stuff, and kills a justifiably angry victim. Some versions even have Jack befriend the giant's wife to manipulate her into helping him steal more things. As a result, the story has been deconstructed plenty of times over the years, notably in the musical Into the Woods. At the end, he would have shrank himself, but couldn't remember the magic words to change back. The story would have ended with him becoming Queen Minnie's footman, and based on the looks on everyone's faces in the concept art, they all seem okay with this arrangement. Although ultimately cut, this plot point is still foreshadowed when Willie is shown having trouble remembering the fee five fo fum words. Anastasia was voiced by Lucille Bliss, who had a steady voice acting career beyond the movie. Among other roles, she was the longtime voice of Smurfette, and she memorably voiced Miss Bitters in Invader Zim. In the second segment, Tall Tale, Jack is turned into a human by the fairy godmother. This does not deter Pom Pom from stalking him. In fact, in one of the only moments to get a real chuckle from me, we see her doing the math in her head that a mouse in a human's body is apparently the same as a swarm of mice. Delicious and filling. The Disney version of their story is pretty true to the original poem, while adding some extra slapstick and setting the verses to a bouncy tune. The ending has changed slightly as well. While the adorable oysters do still meet their demise, a rather bold move for Disney, it's the greedy walrus who eats them all behind the carpenter's back. His need to be a gentleman is linked to his obsession with good form. He's a monster, and he knows it so attaining this proper behavior is impossible. His dim-witted bosun Smee, however, is so innocent and ignorant that in his humility, Hook believes that he has obtained good form. It's enough to make the captain want to kill Smee, but killing a man for having good form would be bad form. That's another reason Hook hates Peter Pan, since he has also obliviously achieved good form. Novelization, the reason the rat is missed is because the cats creep in and hide it when no one is looking. However, when they realize that Trample will be put down for what's happened, they quickly reveal the hiding place. Even they know getting someone in trouble is one thing, getting someone killed is completely different. The cats are distinctly male in this version. They are given a new jazzy song called What a Shame as they tear the house apart, taking delight in their destruction with a sarcastic sorry not sorry attitude. The major Disney villains, even the most despicable ones, have some sort of motivation. The Wicked Queen is jealous of Snow White's natural beauty. Corella de Vil, Prince John, and Radcliffe are greedy and vain. Jafar, Ursula, Scar, and Hades want power. Gaston can't take being rejected. Frollo has a laundry list of issues. When he tries to warn Maleficent of Philip's escape, he is ultimately turned to stone by Meriwether, the most impulsive of the good fairies. Maleficent's shocked reaction to her stone bird can be interpreted as her being heartbroken over her only friend being essentially killed. That's certainly how I used to view it. But upon rewatching the scene, it seems that she's more angry that Philip and the good fairies have escaped. Contrast her reaction to Ursula when her eels are vaporized. The sea witch might turn her attention back to Ariel and Eric, but she at least takes a few seconds to mourn her little poopsies. Swamp Rat, voiced by Jeff Bennett, is a sly huckster who lives near the farm. 
Call him a shrewd salesman, call him a con artist, call him whatever you'd like. As long as he has his non-existent pockets lined with loot, Swamp Rat doesn't care. But the Dalmatians don't fully regard him as a nemesis like Corella. He's caused them plenty of headaches, yet his slick charm always has them coming back. In Kipling's book, Shere Khan was born with a bad leg. His mother even called him Lungri, meaning lame one. You can understand how that might give someone a complex. ScarJo does get to perform a silky version of Trust in Me over the credits, sounding almost like a James Bond song. What puts them in the villain category is their impatience. At several points, they try to speed things up and kill the cubs to ensure a meal. In the alternate opening, Madam's lawyer warns her that Edgar and Elvira must not know about the will, because greed can corrupt an otherwise good person. This is followed up by a shot of an absolutely devilish Edgar, instantly consumed by greed. On one more note of speculation, given that this is a story reel, the voices are scratch tracks with no credited actors. However, the villain sounds a good deal like Corey Burton. Like Medusa, Snoops' appearance and mannerisms were based on a real person. John Culhane was a journalist and Disney historian. He loved animation, and was always hanging around, or rather, snooping around, the studios, wanting to see the process up close. The only real point of contention came for the final recording session when he recorded McLeach singing. Scott was in a bad mood due to an injury, and refused to sing, saying he didn't find it funny. The extra lines were recorded by Frank Walker. If I didn't Compare him with Danahi from Brother Bear, who I do not consider a villain. Danahi doesn't blame the bear that led to his older brother's death, but when he thinks that it's directly killed his younger brother, he viciously pursues it. What's really going on is a lot more complicated, and when Danahi sees the truth, he instantly throws down his weapon. This is a person who's lost both his brothers in the span of a couple days. He has Funny enough, the VHS cover treats the bear as the main villain. A lot of cover art from this era had the heroes in the foreground and the villain watching from a distance. On the cover of The Fox and the Hound, you can see the bear lumbering through the mist as Little Todd and Copper play. A Goofy movie is driven solely by the conflict between Max and Goofy, and it's great. Soul was a beautiful, engaging story without a true bad guy. But then you have Strange World, which, from my interpretation, seems to actively make fun of people who miss the older classic stories.